Hey, hi Manu. Welcome to the Big Data Mock Interview Series. We are excited to have you. Uh, will you please give you a brief introduction about your, yourself? Yeah, sure, Ankur. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm Manu, and I'm currently working as a staff data engineer at Ahead. Uh, Ahead is a consulting firm which works with other businesses in terms of their cloud engagements and uh, drive the existing on-prem systems to a more uh, kind of like a digital uh, solutions. So I'm currently working on a project with a company called Allied Solutions. So it's a typical insurance-based company based out of Indianapolis. And Allied Solutions have an initiative called Finance Modernization, where they are uplifting their existing on-prem systems to a more uh, cloud-based initiative in terms of like an Oracle Fusion Cloud. So I'm currently leading a team of three engineers uh, on in, in this Finance Modernization Initiative, where we are uplifting a lot of manual processes uh, data flow integrations and trying to automate these things using AWS tech stack. So the primary tool set here, uh, which I've used uh, in this project are uh, the AWS Kinesis, Lambdas, and some S3s for intermediate data storage. So prior to AHEAD, I did work as at Microsoft as a senior data and analytics engineer for three and a half years. Uh, at Microsoft, I was responsible for building out analytics for products related to patients' consultation journey, especially in the radiology sector. So Microsoft has a market share about 80% in the radiology sector. I can explain with a small example. Say, suppose you go to a doctor's office and you were supposed to get a CT scan. So instead of you carrying the reports forward and backward from the doctor's office to a radiologist's office, so we have certain products in place which carry the conversation over the network. So I was responsible for building out analytics, especially the usage analytics, on how these products are being used across the customer base. So my key stakeholders are my customer success teams and my product teams who use my analytics dashboards uh, to see their and develop their future roadmaps. And my customer success teams, especially the sales team who deal with the external clients, use my dashboards for uh, their quarterly conversation calls before their quarterly conversation calls. So prior to uh, making this initiative, this analytics uh, building out the dashboards initiative, my customer success teams are just like doing a manual uh, static visualization, just downloading some data and working out of Excel. But whereas like after building this initiative, it uh, opened the doors for a more dynamic way of showing and projecting our data to the clients. And people can pose like a lot of queries across like different um, range of filters from different uh, time ranges and also like different drill downs on certain uh, categories as well. So prior to that, I did work at Microsoft for two years as a software engineer as well. And in a nutshell, if I had to explain my experience, it's always an overlap between the stakeholders, working with the stakeholders and product owners, as well as the dev teams. So I try to understand the requirements and understand the existing flows from my stakeholders perspective, and then try to convert that into a more technical definition and try to work on the development side of things. Cool. Uh, let's try to understand from your recent project. You mentioned about Kinesis, right? Mm -hmm. Can you please explain me uh, what was the role of Kinesis and what is Kinesis actually in AWS? Sure. So AWS Kinesis is kind of like a, a managed, uh, so since at open source for us, for a streaming solutions, we have something called Kafka, which is okay. a, like a distributed queuing system uh, mm -hmm. where you can uh, publish the messages and consume it on the other end. Whereas you have like the two uh, entities, like uh, producers on one end of the pipeline and consumers at the other end of the pipeline. Say, suppose okay. you have like a queue of data, which is flowing mm -hmm. from one system to another system. So Kinesis mm -hmm. is a similar replicated uh, version of Kafka, but it is fully managed on the AWS. So considering the open source and the cluster management, uh, uh, more of like a managed uh, Kafka on AWS. So since Kafka is okay. open source and you have to deal with the cluster configuration and all the partition tolerance and all the nodes and everything. So Kinesis have abstracts all those things and you can manage it in a more easier manner on the AWS hosted website. Okay, so, cool. Help me to understand, is it uh, producer consumer or publisher subscriber model? So it's a, it's kind of like a publisher subscriber model, but we call the upstream, the data producing things as producers and okay. uh, the data consumers as called, uh, the subscribers are called the consumers in this uh, Okay, great. Uh, in, when we talk about these terms in a software engineering, there is a difference, mm -hmm. fundamental difference between producer consumer and publisher yeah. subscriber, right? Yeah. Uh, will you please explain me the difference between uh, this? Are you ever uh, aware about it? 
like what is the difference between these two things okay uh, i think in terms of like if you consider more on the design patterns of the software application side uh, mm -hmm. there is something called pub sub uh, which is called like the publisher and subscriber model uh, when mm -hmm. you are coming to like the jargon on the data engineering side i think it is converted mm -hmm. into a more of like a producer and consumer uh, the publisher is the producer like who generates the data and the consumer or the subscriber is like who consumes the data on the other end of the queue Cool. Uh, help me to understand. Let's suppose you have produced the data. It will go to some message brokers, right? Mm -hmm. When I have consumed it, like uh, you are con producing the data and it is going to the, let's suppose, Kafka topic or Kinesis, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, some consumer application is trying to consume the data. Yes. Will the data will be lost once consumer consume it or it will retained in the Kafka topic or in Kinesis? Yes. So there is uh, something called the retention period attribute uh, within the Kafka or uh, Kinesis uh, in, the, in the message broker. So there is uh, the limit is like seven days. So the 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 data stays in the queue for seven days, and uh, then it is like uh, deleted. So within the seven days, you can uh, reaccess the data within the queue. Okay. Uh, do you understand that? How does Kafka skills like uh, Kafka or any other uh, publisher subscriber, uh, what you call uh, even streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. Why does they are so much in demand, and why in most of your project it actually fits in? What is the re uh, re uh, real reason of there were many messaging queue. Even you can implement a simple mes uh, queue, right? Mm -hmm. What is the difference between a simple messaging queue and messaging queue like Kafka or Kinesis? What is the fundamental difference between them? Sure. Uh, so considering uh, the differences between like a normal uh, um, a queue, like it just like has like two ends and uh, the data flows through that one. And what's mm -hmm. the difference between a more managed things like Kafka or Kinesis? It's like it's a distributed in manner. So it's highly scalable for your workloads. So today, if your traffic increases tomorrow by uh, 10x times of like what's today, the, the queue can scale up and it can accommodate the data flow. Whereas in a regular queue cannot accommodate a data flow in that manner. So it's highly scalable, uh, considering the Kafka and uh, Kinesis. And uh, it's also so considering a normal queue versus a Kafka queue, if I had to compare the things. So a normal mm -hmm. queue is like just a data flow between like two systems, whereas a Kafka mm -hmm. or a Kinesis is a more distributed manner. So it supports mm -hmm. parallelism and uh, it, it can accommodate more traffic as uh, per your needs. So okay. since- uh, uh, Sorry to cut you off. Help me to understand when you say parallel. So do you understand what is partition in the Kafka topic? What is partitions? So uh, the, the stream of data gets divided into uh, topics and uh, the topics are divided into partitions in uh, the Kafka. So it's kind of like uh, maintaining for the fault tolerance part. So uh, Kafka is also like fault tolerant. Say, suppose uh, if one of the broker is down in the middle, uh, it has a replication factor uh, within. Uh, so another broker rises up in that case and uh, it can handle the things. Whereas in a regular queue, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you don't yeah. handle, you don't handle all these uh, parallelism or uh, you don't see any, any fault tolerance mechanisms in a regular queue. That makes is a difference. Mm -hmm. Got it. So is it possible to order the data in a, this type of distributed messaging queue? Can you uh, order your data? Uh, yes, you can order your stream of data uh, based on the keys. So um, you can send the data as it is and flows through the system uh, in the order but of what is the ordering will only happening in the partitions or across different partitions. So let's suppose I'm having 10 messages. I'm producing the data, right? When I'm producing the data, when I push the data into this type of distributed uh, messaging queue, will the order will be maintained? Let's suppose I'm pushing one, two, three, four, five, six. Will, when someone, uh, try consuming it, like mm -hmm. they subscribe to some topic and try consuming it. Will they able to consume in the same order? Yes. Or, the message, or the ordering is only maintained in the partitions and in the individual partitions. Like you can mention, uh, maintain about the order in the partitions, not in overall, not, not in a total Kafka uh, topic, right? You can only maintain the ordering in the certain pa uh, partitions, like partition, mm -hmm. one partition you can uh, maintain the order. On other partitions, you can maintain the order, but it will never you can, you can never make sure that uh, the ordering will be actually maintained within uh, like multiple partitions. Am I correct or am I wrong? Sorry, I lost if you are speaking. 
uh sorry man i lost you if you if you if you were yeah listening. you're breaking like you your screen has frozen uh okay uh let me help you to so what i was saying that when you talk about uh messaging distributed messaging queue or even streaming platforms like kafka or kinesis does the ordering is maintained a cross partitions or ordering is only maintained inside a single partition like you can maintain the order in one partition of the topic then you can again mention the order in another uh, uh, what you call another partitions uh, mm -hmm. another partitions but you cannot maintain the order overall am i right or wrong uh i think that is right like since your uh, data gets split up into partitions when uh, it's going through the flow uh, the queue so uh, you can maintain the partitions within the uh, you can maintain the ordering within the partitions uh, but not across mm -hmm. the partitions yeah okay uh, what is priority queue have you heard about it yes a uh, priority queue is, is kind it? of like uh, in terms of like a data structure it's a typical data structure uh, so priority mm -hmm. queue is like um, so in in terms of like considering a regular queue where like it it works on like the first and first out uh, if you consider a regular queue that's the 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 algorithm behind it is like who goes in first who will come out first Okay. but whereas priority queue is something like uh, say suppose you have like two different lines like vip and a normal line so if you have like a higher priority you are uh, going to be out of the queue uh, on a more priority based manner so for priority queue you can consider like every element or every object has a priority number associated with it and uh, the 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 objects with higher priority takes uh, the higher uh, say on that one and they get out of the queue uh, uh, in that manner so you can push out the objects in the the priority queues order okay so what is your favorite programming language uh, i can do python like i've been working on python since uh, five to six years so i'm uh, pretty okay. much okay uh, will you please help me to understand how can you actually implement priority queue in python just the simple pseudo code will work okay uh so in terms of like um from a normal queue and a priority queue the difference is uh you can add, you need to get like the priority numbers uh, associated with the queue so uh, what's the order of uh the operation you want to do on the elements so you could imagine like a tuple of uh, the object or a number or any item and a priority associated with that so in that manner you can push into the queue and get back the Uh, the order of elements in the in terms of like the priority order so i could consider this as okay. like uh, um you can implement the priority yeah. queue in terms of like a heap data structure so uh, so that can okay. um, operate the order of um, operations in terms of like priority queue okay uh do you know the difference between process and thread what is the fundamental difference between them uh i missed your question uh what is the difference between process and thread in operating system okay a uh, process is like a, a set of uh, operations or set of uh, say you consider like uh, say suppose let's take an analogy of a recipe uh, so you have like certain steps to follow uh, or um, you have like a group of operations to do so that is a process to in order to complete a task you have a group of operations to do whereas task uh, uh, process and thread thread is like a single task of single unit of work which is happening in the cpu level mhm mm okay if you have to so combine have like multiple threads and multiple operations then it becomes a process cool have you heard about the cap theorem yes uh, so cap theorem is something related to the the databases um especially on the consistency yes i have heard about the cap theorem is a it's called like a consistency availability and partition tolerance a theorem so it's kind mm -hmm. of like um how the databases perform uh in a distributed especially in the distributed manner so mm -hmm. uh, there are like three attributes like either the data to be consistent uh, available or partition tolerant uh, but out of cap theorem what cap theorem states is like you could achieve only two of these operations out of the three and together the three operations are not available for any distributed data set say suppose if you want to see your uh, consistency if you want to prioritize consistency in terms of like a bank applications consistency matters mm -hmm. the most rather than availability or part uh, rather than availability 
say your operations has to be consistent say if your uh, money is detected it has to reflect in the bank in others account uh, so the database state has to be consistent whereas if you consider any like a social media feed uh, like an instagram account so when you consider the number of likes account so availability takes a priority here rather than over consistency it doesn't need to you doesn't need to have like the exact number of post likes it can update uh, in a while as well so uh, availability matters in this system most so based on the requirements of your project you have to choose like over the consistency over or availability on which manner which is like the most priority for your project and design the distributed database in certain manner cool will you please share your screen let's try solving some of the problems okay okay can you see it now yeah yeah okay just one minute please let me okay so if you can see uh, this problem this is very interesting problem okay mm -hmm. so let's suppose you are working for apple okay okay and if you have seen the people who buy apple products mm -hmm. people have tendency of buying iphone mm -hmm. and then they will buy airpods yeah. right yeah so as an analytical manager mm -hmm. your task is mm -hmm. to understand that what is the percentage of users or mm -hmm. customer who mm -hmm. are buying iPods after iPhone. Okay. If you can see this particular example, can you go up a little up? Let me write the SQL problem for you. Can you go up? Yeah. And will you do one thing? Like click on that. Uh, uh, can you go up? Oh. Uh, Let's okay. like no. Go to the problem statement. Okay. Yeah. And can you do command plus? So you can, it is little maximized. Cool. Okay. So let me read the questions for you. Write mm -hmm. a SQL query to determine the percentage of buyers who bought AirPods directly after they bought iPhones. But I've oh. given one example to you. If you go to the, this example, can you go little down? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you can see, Customer ID 101 has bought iPhones on 8th. Then, same person have also bought AirPods on 8th, like same day. Okay. But 301, customer ID 301 has bought iPhone. And mm -hmm. after that, he or she has bought iPad. Then, they have bought AirPods. So, okay. I'm not interested in 301. I'm okay. only interested... In those Eight persons five. who are buying iPhone first or after mm -hmm. some day or on the same date, it doesn't matter, but they are buying the airports. So here, as an analytical manager, I will try to understand that what is the dependency between two products. You're mm -hmm. Getting my point? So this yeah. is a very interesting problem to solve. Okay. Uh, will you please think for a couple of minutes and help me to understand how can you write this SQL query? And just let me, your, uh, let me know your approach. Sure. So uh, as far as the uh, understanding the question, I understand is like the first transaction should be iPhone and following the immediate transaction should be AirPods. So you want to identify yes. the percentage of such users who bought like iPhone and AirPods like in a, in a consecutive manner. Uh, so yes, since we yeah. are dealing with like consecutive uh, transactions, especially in the, mm -hmm. uh, based on the user. So the one thing that mm -hmm. got me in my mind is uh, using um, uh, a lag function uh, ordered uh, by lag function. Yeah. Okay. And ordered by the transaction uh, timestamp. So, okay. uh, uh, so, so first a row should be like uh, the lagged value for the AirPods uh, should be uh, iPhone or uh, you can use like either a lag or a lead function. So after okay. iPhone, the lead value should be AirPods. Um, so if okay. you consider that uh, for the same user, if uh, you see that patterns, you can filter out those okay. users. Okay. Will you please write the code for me? Okay, sure. Um, so first I wanted to construct the, the lead column or a lag column. I can choose uh, anything okay. like if I wanted to. So let's go from like the forward direction, like the first user has to buy like iPhone and then AirPods, right? Okay. So the okay. if you consider like the current row as an iPhone and the next value mm -hmm. should be AirPods, like in your filtered case. Uh, so okay. you can use like a lead function and see mm -hmm. like the product name. 
so what would be the product name in the lead function for the next transaction and if it is an airpods um we can say that um uh we can uh, say that uh, this customer follows the pattern cool uh, blue please write the code uh, i wanted to see that how you are actually writing the windows functions sure uh, let me write here so first i wanted to calculate the the lead value so what is the lead value for each transaction mm -hmm. and since we are given here the customer id i wanted to partition by customer id and uh, order it by the transaction okay. time stamp as well so okay. if you consider okay. uh, what do you call this um uh let's say like frequent buyers okay and uh i want uh, customer id product transaction timestamp so what is this table called transactions okay so i am uh, getting uh, the customer id the product name and transaction timestamp and mm -hmm. the lead of the product name so i'm partitioning it over by the customer id and order by the transaction mm -hmm. timestamp it. so it gives mm -hmm. like the the next product what the customer has brought so i'm okay. uh, taking it as like a constructing a new column it would be a new column as next product and now okay. my query would be like um uh from based out of the cd um select um user id from um cd where product name equal to iphone next got yeah i i got your approach i think you will be able to solve it next uh next move to the next problem statement uh, your approach is correct i just wanted to see if you are able to apply this leader lag or not cool. okay. uh, let me uh, and from question. here i think you need to apply the percentage like by count star yeah, like yeah fine uh, the main problem you, you were able to solve it okay. just give me a minute let me post the questions for you just one minute please okay can you see the questions yeah you are you have so given me a Mm -hmm. uh, I'm giving you a dictionary, mm -hmm. and I'm iterating over that dictionary. And if okay. you go down, mm -hmm. I'm checking the value. If it is like the module is divided by two, then I'm deleting something. Okay. Can you let me know? Is the, uh, will this code run, or it will throw some error? Mm, uh, yes. So you are iterating over your keys in the dictionary, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the key is not a number and you are mm -hmm. trying to do a mod by 2 so this would raise an error here itself in Why? the my value i uh, am um, dictionary if you can see for key in my dict right so my dict will be like the value right so if i uh, so my dict my dict is a dictionary right so i am just iterating over it and then if i do my dict key then it will show me that a is equal oh, okay. to 2 value one. right okay, okay okay value okay. oh sorry about that uh yeah so my dict of key is 1 here like if you go to the first one yes so 1 mod 2 so this uh, python problem is like mm -hmm. so see this python problem is like i want to delete all those element from my dictionary mm -hmm. which are even number mm -hmm. So will okay. this code work? For key in my dictionary, uh, delete my dict of key. Um, mm, I think it works. Will you able to delete something if you are iterating over that dictionary, and you are iterating over that dictionary using for loop? Will you able to delete the element from dictionary, or will it throw the runtime error? Uh. usually updating the dictionary right deleting the key right. from the dictionary mm -hmm. do you understand how delete works in uh i'm not sure exactly about the operation of delete like how it works in the exactly. dictionary error. thing uh, it will actually throw the error or okay. throw the run time error you cannot delete something from the um, when you are iterating over that particular dictionary okay okay okay, okay. cool man Okay uh let's so you have mentioned that you were doing 
power bi and multiple etl process in your last second last job right so yes. microsoft and others i hope you might have also used uh, pandas and mm -hmm. numpy yeah. to write your code right yeah have you used pandas and numpy yes uh, like i'm aware about that okay so what is the fundamental difference between pandas and pyspark okay uh so uh in terms of like operations like what you can do uh both are like look alike uh, so they are like they can assume like you basically work on a data frame uh, apis on both the sides so data mm -hmm. frame is something like you can imagine the, the data being arranged in terms of like rows and columns uh so um, you can read a table uh, and consume it into a form of a data frame or a file and uh, consume it in, a, in the form of data frame and read it into a data frame and apply like operations or transformations Mm -hmm. so the fundamental difference between pandas and um uh, pyspark is like pandas work everything in memory uh, so whereas uh, you have to load the entire uh, data frame uh, or entire file into your memory and it works on your local system whereas pyspark scales up into a more distributed manner so for a much larger loads you can't work everything load into your single node system and work on a single computer or a local computer for such bigger mm -hmm. loads Uh, PySpark operates in a more distributed manner, especially in a clustered manner, where it could split the partitions of the input uh, file into a uh, partitions and spread the work across like multiple uh, node clusters. So uh, the operations kind like you you can derive the same thing, but only the parallelism is different between like PySpark what you do in PySpark versus Pandas. Cool. Uh, so let's suppose uh, you under you multiple developers works right. Mm -hmm. so let's suppose you have been given some migrations project where okay. the previous teams has developed their etl pipeline using pandas okay now your job is to use pyspark as a computing engine mm -hmm. and do the same things which your existing pipeline which was written in pandas was doing so okay. what if, what will be your strategy what you will communicate to your teams and how you will actually design this system so this migrations activity will be lot more easier what all things you will take into consideration sure uh, definitely you say suppose if some existing system of which has to be migrated in uh, pandas written in pandas and the the target thing you wanted to be in pyspark so i would first analyze the 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 data load so what kind what the size of the data the the system is being processed on on the transformation layer especially uh, so then uh, i would sorry Manu, I... Will you please repeat Okay. Uh, the first thing uh, which comes to my mind while assessing the migration is like, what is the size of the data load uh, on an average? Uh, the pandas or pyspark needs to uh, transform uh, in a single stage. Uh, so that uh, gives me some idea on uh, the cluster configuration for a pyspark since it's a more distributed manner. Uh, so I need to configure the number of nodes I need, number of worker nodes I need, and the memory configurations as well, uh, based on the cluster mm -hmm. size. so uh, giving a rough estimate on the data loads uh, would give me some idea on the pointers on the size of the cluster which i could choose like a small cluster or a medium or 10 node cluster or 20 node cluster so that is the first step i would do in in terms of like assessing the data and also i would uh, analyze like what are the input uh, and output of file formats as well so uh, how the data is being loaded uh, read into the pandas right now is it just like csv or any other column based like parquet formats um whereas the same things i wanted to analyze like how the target systems and in an ideal future system design uh, how the workflow should be designed so uh, i want to assess the, the data volume and the input and output uh, load strategies as well uh, and also the load strategies as well is it like more on the streaming side or more on the batch side uh, depending upon the the frequency of the data coming into the flowing into the pyspark so based on these um, assumptions i would um, in, if i had to like to go for the pyspark thing the first thing i would uh, design the cluster configuration according to my needs uh, based on the input data file they say you have like 10 gb and then i would divide that into like the number of like hdfs blocks uh, in terms of like a 128 mb and uh, kind of like determine the number of partitions and uh, design my cluster nodes and configure the number of cores inside that so each task is handled uh, in each core uh, of the executor node so i would handle uh, in those cases uh, and then come coming to the so operation side 
Mm-hmm. Okay, and coming to the operation side uh, as well, um, you need um, it, it. It's kind of like a similar since we are handling both on the data wrangling side of things. Uh, Pandas also supports mm-hmm. like joins and uh, a small data wrangling operation operations like replace column or missing columns, missing and filling it with NAs and uh, all the uh, the data wrangling side. It's kind of like a similar operations, uh, but might be a syntax might be a little different, uh, but it's almost the same. Like the overall idea is the same, and um, PySpark offers some optimizations on the join techniques as well, uh, in terms of like a broadcast join um, or any shuffle merge join for if you have like two big uh, data loads, with two tables, bigger tables to join. So uh, those are some opt- optimizations which we, we could apply on the PySpark side of things. Cool, great, uh, great answer. But do you require some scheduler also, like uh, when you are having the PySpark applications, will you require some scheduler to schedule your PySpark jobs? Uh, yes, of course. So when you are uh, uh, combining like the different transformations or extraction layers, uh, you need something like an orchestrator or scheduler uh, to um, streamline the process so that you don't need to run every process by your own uh, on a manual intervention. Say you run the extract program and then like wait for a few, uh, wait until it's executed and then run the transform program and everything. So if you have something like an Airflow or any other scheduler enabled or any cloud-based uh, even scheduler, so if you streamline the process in such manner, uh, it executes in a sequential manner. So once your extract process is done, uh, the transform uh, process gets kicked off and then comes the loading process. So everything ha- can happen in a sequential manner. It's just like one trigger you need uh, in the beginning of the pipeline and it executes till the end of the pipeline. Okay, great. So you mentioned about uh, in your project, you have used ETL, right? Extract, transform, and then load. Yeah. Are you about, uh, aware about something called ELT, extract, yes. load, and transform? Are you aware about that? What is the difference between ETL process and ELT process? Sure. Uh, so ETL is kind of like an older paradigm uh, versus like ELT, which is more on the modern data warehousing or modern data engineering side of stack. Uh, it's just like the order of operations mm-hmm. differs in both the paradigms. Uh, whereas in the ETL paradigm, you just transform the load, uh, you just transform the data after extraction uh, from a source system, You you the transformation uh, layer is held, uh, where the data is like cleaned and thoroughed and data wrangled. And then the only the, the purest form, when the data is in the purest form, it gets loaded into the, the final target system or a data warehouse. Mm-hmm. Whereas over the ELT, uh, it follows that uh, from the raw data, it just uh, loads everything into a data warehouse or a target system. And the transformation layer is uh, the last thing which is happening in this uh, data flow. So you have every uh, raw data is in your data system, uh, data target system, and transformation layer uh, takes uh, later after the loading strategy. So this is kind of like a more modernized way of doing, and um, there are certain tools and uh, text like text tags like DBT, which is supporting uh, where you can do more on SQL-based uh, transformations uh, on once the data is in the database. Uh, more, uh, it is more suitable for analysts who are not very uh, heavy on the programming side or handling like a PySpark or working in a distributed manner. This is one way of transforming the data on the databases side. Uh, it could help the people who are like heavily on SQL focused. Uh, they can help these transformations by themselves on the distribution, uh, on the database side, rather than waiting for a data engineer to transform the data and then load it into the systems. Okay, great. Uh, so can you give some real world exp- uh, scenario, some scenario which you might have worked in your past, where you think that actually ELT was better suited there or if you can imagine some uh, some scenario where mm-hmm. elt was is better suited for real world scenario mm-hmm. uh, okay um so uh, in terms of like elt uh, versus like etl um the if you if you are uh, if your transformation is not so heavy i would say uh, only a little data wrangling which could be handled by the databases even databases mm-hmm. are good at handling some transformations like if you are just like wanted to like rename the columns or uh, do some simple things not just like a mm-hmm. very complex side of things uh, versus like it's just like comparison like which does best either is PySpark good at your transformations or are your databases good at your transformations when so you database, your... you mean to say data warehouse or database yeah. solutions not data warehouse. transactional data yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, it's kind of like uh, bringing the trade-offs like which best suits for your project or uh, for your particular uh, case. Uh, so if Pipe Spark is good at doing things, if, if the data is like very huge and loads of data, and you could op uh, opt for a ETL, a traditional ETL mechanism where everything is handled by the Pipe Spark before loading the data, and only the finest data is loaded into your database uh, data warehouse. But as coming back to um, something like ELT. Um, so you can assume your database is capable of doing all the transformations, uh, then a more ELT. And if it depends upon the team structure also, right? The, the skill set of the teams as well. So if you have a lot of analysts, you can more opt for an ELT manner so that analysts can plug in and uh, work on their transformation layer and work uh, on their metrics as well. Whereas you have like a team of data engineers who are more specialized on the PySpark side of things and tuning and configuration of PySpark. You can go on the ETL side of things. I think it also it depends upon a lot of factors on which manner you choose. Uh, in the end, it mm -hmm. would be the same way, but the order of operations different is different. Uh, it depends upon like your team structure and what kind of like tools you're using. And always remember like storage is um, compute is expensive than storage. Storage is cheaper, so uh, you can uh, make the trade offs in that manner. Mm, great. Uh, you have. You work with PySpark intensively. Have you done optimizations, some Spark optimization in your project? Can you name few of them? Sure. Uh, so some of the optimizations which I have done on my project, which come to my mind immediately, uh, was one I could think of as like uh, optimizing the join strategies, especially mm -hmm. in my PySpark code, uh, where I was, uh, in, in terms of like the transformation layer, I had like two uh, tables which have to join and load the data into a data warehouse, uh, especially if you consider like I am trying to build up a star schema on my data warehouse and I have to do some joins on my fact table and the dimension table before loading. So uh, one class classic strategy which I have applied and optimized here is kind of like using a broadcast join uh, because uh, this suits my broadcasting uh, where like my a smaller data set is my dimensional table is a smaller data set compared to my fact table, which is like wide in uh, scope. And uh, so uh, broadcasting a smaller data set across the data nodes uh, could uh, optimize in terms of like the shuffling uh, strategies. So I could reduce the shuffling and uh, partition it and join it quickly compared to like a regular join. So this is one thing which I have implemented uh, in my PySpark code. And another one which where I have seen like the improvements of performance uh, is by using a Cairo serializer over a Java regular serializer, which Spark uh, gives us. Uh, so uh, I've seen like uh, the improvements in the processing times because uh, there is a lot of network IO involved uh, whenever any shuffling is involved, whenever there is an exchange of data between your nodes of systems, uh, you need to have like a better serialization and deserialization of efforts uh, where the data needs to be like compressed and decompressed in that manner. Uh, so Cairo serialization uh, of, um, offers like a better uh, compact uh, serialization compared to a regular one. So this is something uh, I have uh, implemented in my code as well. And I've seen the results also improved as well uh, in terms of my running my job performance. And uh, I also do a lot of like reviews on my uh, peers code reviews as well. So I try to see where I could optimize the things where the code could be optimized uh, uh, based on the based on the existing code and try to uh, give some constructive feedback on that uh, aspect as well. And uh, in such cases also, I have noticed uh, some room for improvement on my peers code as well. Uh, so since we are uh, working with different joins and different manipulations, uh, we could uh, cache some of our intermediate results rather than like recomputing them every time. If we are using the same data multiple times, if uh, there is a lookup table, say suppose, and I've used in using in the same notebook for uh, multiple joins, I could uh, implement uh, something uh, on a caching strategy on that table. So where I could uh, easily get access to that rather than like reading it completely from the file from the beginning and triggering the entire job again. So this, these are some things like I also have uh, given some optimization um, feedbacks to my peers where they could improve the code as well. Great. So these all are uh, uh, what you call optimization at transformations level. So, yes. But you have been involved in big data ETL pipeline. So have you done something, some optimizations at extract level and some optimization at loader level also? Will you please explain it? 
Sure, uh, definitely. So uh, while extracting the files as well, right? Uh, so I was very particular about like choosing the right file format, uh, especially for my teams. Uh, so since um, my data is coming from a traditional RDBMS databases, uh, when I do write the extract things, uh, I try to uh, uh, store the data, the extracted data in a more um, in a parquet file format because it offers a lot of like better compression while in terms of like storing the data into a data lake as well and also offers like the columnar storage uh, options where uh, it supports uh, it's uh, it's very beneficial on my downstream side of things so all my inputs and outputs are i have chosen like the parquet to be my the input file format as well as like the output file format when i'm reading and writing out of my spark systems as well so this offered me a better compression strategies and better optimization compared to a, a traditional CSV based approach. Uh, it offers like additional components like metadata handling and uh, more uh, with the snappy compression, it uh, is optimizes the storage as well. Yeah, so you mentioned the file format, I got it. Like you are choosing the better file format while you are reading the data and loading the data. But you yeah. also mentioned about RDBMS systems, which is your source, right? So when you are reading the data using a sparse, you might have been creating JDBC connections, right? So when you are creating the JDBC connections, right? So is there any optimizations that you are doing while reading the data from a Spark? And when your source is some RDBMS systems like Oracle, Postgres or MySQL? Sure, uh, definitely. There is uh, something called like the parallel thread operations on the database side of things. So I have requested my upstream so, uh, source teams uh, uh, to open up like the maximum number of connections that I could connect to the database and run my uh, copying task very on a concrete manner uh, so that uh, I could extract in a more optimized manner and a more parallelized manner rather than on a sequential order. This is something I have requested my upstream uh, teams and uh, explaining about like what I'm doing on the downstream and bringing out these requirements. And I have raised this request to open up a lot of connections on the upstream side. So it's the data is extracted and run on a more parallelized way rather than a single load system. Right. So you might have used number of partitions, lower bound yes. and upper bound, right? When yes. we're creating JDBC connections. Great. So when, when you write the data, do you write the data in a single folder or you create multiple partitions folder? when you are writing the data. Okay, so uh, even that depends upon my downstream analytics and I would uh, assess my analytics requirements as well. And uh, yeah, data is definitely not written in a single file. Uh, so I would partition the data in terms of like, if I have like a day-based approaches, especially in my uh, data, I have uh, split the data into like a day-wise partitions and uh, uploaded the data in terms of like, uh, created the partitions for like each partition for each day uh, so that it could uh, be beneficial for the downstream queries and more efficient way of partitioning. Sorry, I, the data. Great. Uh, yeah, I got your point. I was not able to hear it clearly, but no problem. So what is the version of Spark that you are using in your current project? Uh, I think it's 3.2 we are using. So are you ever aware about AQE, -E, mm -hmm. right? Yes, uh, it's an adaptive query. Uh, optimization, AQE. Uh, so AQE, what does it do is like, um, it uh, dynamically adjusts your code. So based on the runtime uh, uh, efforts. So it tries to optimize your code uh, in terms like, um, uh, like a predicate push down, like it tries to filter applying the filters like before the join conditions. So it will be like you are handing over like very less data in terms of like exchange of data or anything. And it also tries to optimize in terms of like the join strategies as well uh, with the latest version. Um, so depending upon your size of the data and the two join call two, two joining tables, it tries to apply the more optimized uh, manner, uh, more optimized join uh, based on the runtime of data. Okay, great. Uh, I think Manu, I'm done with my interview. Uh, do you have any questions? On me uh, so I just wanted to ask like the feedback if I am like lacking in any uh, areas or is there like any room for improvement for my performance yeah you you did uh, done great uh, but some of the things which you can actually like improve like when I'm asking about the optimizations you are thinking about your transformations only you should mm -hmm. also think about extract you should also mm -hmm. think about the loader part right I have not mm -hmm. asked you the optimization just in the transformation part. So whenever mm -hmm. some interviewer is trying to ask some questions, right? 
so you can explain in a lot more depth right because you have done a lot of optimizations while you are extracting the data while you are loading the data don't only uh, stop yourself in the transformations part so that's the okay. one thing another thing is like the when you when you are you were asked about pandas uh, code base migrations to pi spark there mm -hmm. you were doing good uh, you have uh, explained it beautifully also but you can go more in depth right because this is like your strong zone right as a data engineers you are aware about the problem statement when you move from single uh, node machines where the pandas runs right uh, mm -hmm. to a distributed systems it comes with a lot of challenges and lot of benefits right so you should mention about the challenges that you might face then you should mention about the uh, what what optimization you can do right like okay. you mentioned about broadcast when you can mention multiple other things like you can mention about a queue like you should mention that I, I will go by the higher version of a spark right mm -hmm. and you also forget about the airflow like for running the spark jobs you need some scheduling right so mm -hmm. i have to make you remind about it right okay. so you already know many things right but when in when you are in driver seat when you are explaining the uh, answers mm -hmm. instead of creating multiple lines of one concept create three lines and that three line cons should consist of three concepts it looks okay. much cleaner right much better like if you know something keep it short but talk about multiple other things that you know right like press your mind while explaining the answers uh, like uh, you just add the airflow add optimization add broadcast like mm -hmm. add about the different clusters which you have done actually uh, like little more if you elaborate your answer it will become a lot more cleaner a lot more bit better i think i am done with uh, my interview uh, but yeah you are doing good wherever you will go uh, you will do great in your uh, career and your way of explaining like you also mentioned about the code review and other things that was really really good you should, if you have done code review and other part you should actually mention in your interview and it becomes uh, like it shows lot more credit lot more uh, better developers uh, because you are not only coding the systems but you are also maintaining teams and trying to create some culture in the teams right and good tech culture. So yeah, mm -hmm. that is uh, from my side. Thank you for your times and good luck for your future. Thank you. Thank you, Ankur. Thank you for having me.